welcome everyone, uh, uh, especially our speakers, and, uh, our panelists. I'll introduce you now. So, our speakers today are Chris, Dr. Chris Voisey, and Dr. Lisa Hart Madigan, uh, joining us from uh, Melbourne and London, respectively. And to sort of drive the discussion, we invited our expert panelists, Angela S. Combe and Katie Evans. Uh, and I'll introduce them. So Angela Escombe spent uh, four years as an exploration geologist at Anglo Ashanti before earning her PhD at CODES, University of Tasmania. Uh, and she's there at the moment doing a, a sort of postdoc lectureship. And she's become known for her work on making geological and geometallurgical predictions on ores using multiple data sets and uh, advanced computing techniques like machine learning. Uh, in particular, ores from porphyry copper deposits, uh, which is why we invited Angela. And we're really uh, delighted to have her join us today. Uh, Angela, do you want to quickly say hi? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me along. Looking forward to the talks tonight. I know Lisa and Chris both give excellent talks, so I'm sure it's going to be uh, an enjoyable evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Thanks, Angela. So Katie Evans uh, is an associate professor at Curtin University in Perth. She has a, had a very successful career so far, uh, grappling with the real nitty gritty geochemical and especially redox related uh, problems facing various kinds of ore deposit and subduction models, uh, including orogenic gold and porphyry copper deposits, uh, which is why uh, we're very lucky to have her on as a panelist today. Katie, do you wanna briefly say hi? Yeah, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to these talks too. I think they're going to be great. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Angela. And thanks, Katie. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker is uh, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Hart Madigan. Lisa Hart uh, Madigan is an exploration geologist and geochemist with experience in mineral exploration and in applied research of geochemical exploration techniques. Lisa worked for seven years in, on mineral exploration in Western Australia uh, and West Africa with BHP before embarking on a PhD at Imperial College in London. Her PhD, finished last year in 2019, focused on developing geochemical tools to explore for undercover porphyry copper deposits. Her study area was the Oyu Tolgoi district in Mongolia, where she used newly developed chemical exploration techniques to identify interesting targets for future exploration. Since completing her PhD, Lisa has continued her research at the Natural History Museum in London expanding the scope to include geochemical exploration techniques for epithermal environments as well. Lisa, uh, the floor is yours and we will look forward to your talk. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say massive thank you to everyone at Ore Deposits Hub for basically keeping us all so well connected during this weird year we've, we're having. And also thanks for letting me uh, present some of my research. So today I'm presenting some of my research from my PhD project, um, which um, was in Oyotolgoi. And I was looking at propolitic alteration and developing geochemical tools there. So just a quickly about green rock um, exploration tools. You may have seen one of the most recent issues of economic geology, which was specifically all about um, green rock exploration or propolitic alteration tools. And um, you can see here a couple of the papers. Basically, the propolitic halo is so extensive. It's the most extensive zone around a porphyry deposit. And it may be the only part of the deposit that's visible at the surface. So these new tools look at things like chlorite compositions or epidote compositions to give us an idea of the location of an ore body at depth or to give us an idea about the fertility of that ore body. Now these, um, these uh, studies are usually done on known deposits, so that's how we develop the tools. So we've got an example here from El Teniente where we've got chloride compositions um, showing basically the exact location of the deposit. And on the right hand side was um, Dave Cook's paper where he did a blind test at resolution, or sorry, they did a blind test at resolution and using chloride chemistry were basically able to pinpoint the location of the ore body again. So that's just a bit of background. So the reason that Oyotolgoi is important or interesting is that it's a much older porphyry district. It's late Devonian in age. 
And since the mineralization, there have been multiple magmatic hydrothermal events in the vicinity of the deposits. So there's potential there for overprinting hydrothermal systems on top of the porphyry halo. So can you, you it's difficult to just apply geo geochemical exploration tools here because the actual systematic changes in compositions of minerals have been perturbed. So what we need to do here, we need an extra step. We need to be able to discriminate between propolitic alteration in the porphyry halo from that which is not related to mineralization. And that's where titanite geochronology comes in using looking at hydrothermal titanite. So this is just um, a picture here of the Gobi, just to give you an idea of if you're mapping in that area, the kind of exposure you're dealing with, which is not that much. So, um, and also I'm just going to go through the geology of OT because it's, oh, sorry, Oyotolgoi, because it's important to set that scene. So this is the Oyotolgoi district. You can see the deposits there. They sit on a 15 kilometre trend, north, northeast, south, southwest, and you can see those in red. And they sit within a Devonian inlier flanked by carboniferous rocks. So if I take you through the most important units, here in green we've got volcanics from and volcanoclastics from the Oyotolgoi sequence and they are intruded by late Devonian quartz monzodiorite stocks and dikes which are the causal plutons for mineralization. And you can see those are limited to that Devonian inlier that's um, bounded by numerous faults it's been quite shuffled up there. So the Devonian inlier that's flanked by carboniferous volcanics and volcanoclastics which are also intruded um, by granodiorites and granite plutons that are voluminous and were intruded around the early and mid in two phases in the early and mid carboniferous and they sit just to the west of the deposits and to the south. Now the final magmatic hydrothermal event was um, huge. It was the emplacement of the Cambog granite. Now the Cambog granite is, a, is one of the largest alkaline batholiths in the world. It's huge. It sits only a few kilometers away from the deposits themselves and it's up to 30 kilometers in diameter across. So you can see that there over to the east. And then in this, I just wanted to show these samples were collected for my PhD and um, each one specifically because they exhibited propolitic assemblages. So they had epidote, chlorite, albite, calcite, those sorts of things, pyrite even. And you can see that propolitic alteration is widespread, not just in the Devonian rocks, but in the Carboniferous rocks as well. And just another note, everything in the Devonian inlier is relatively well constrained from drilling, mapping, detailed mapping. It's a huge area and, and as you saw from the exposure, not all of that has been mapped in detail. So that's quite an important point. And in black, those are the samples that we selected for titanite geochronology because we wanted a spread across the area, but also they had to have enough titanite that was large enough for us to analyze. So in case you're not familiar with propolitic alteration, this is a typical slice through a porphyry system. In the center here, you've got the porphyry stock, which is surrounded by the potassic alteration zone in the center. And if you go upwards from that zone, you go into acidic alteration in the lithocap environment. But what we're looking at is the lateral alteration that spreads for several kilometers away from the center. So the propolytic zone is zoned itself. Um, in the center, you usually see, um, a, or you might see, a higher temperature zone, which is characterized by the presence of actinolite, along with epidote and chloride, etc. And then beyond that, you have a rel relatively extensive zone of epidote um, alteration. And then the weakest zone beyond that is characterized by chloride, predominantly chloride and other um, minerals like calcite, etc. And in the center, you can see there in the speckle, that's the pyrite halo. So that is a zone where you see abundant pyrite that's been precipitated. So uh, just so you can see what the rocks might look like in these different zones, I'll take you through some of the rocks from um, Oyotolgoi. Now, 
um, porphyritic argite basalt of the Oyotolgai sequence is one of the main host rocks for mineralization. So each one of these um, is just an example of that. So you can see the different fasces. So here we've got the actinolite zone where the argite phenocrysts have been replaced by actinolite. And then in the pyrite halo, you can see here we've got pyrite with epido in veins, and then with um, albite K feldspar halos. You've then also got below that, you've got disseminated patchy um, pyrite again with epido as well. So that's the kind of thing you'd see in the pyrite halo. And then the epidote zone at OT is so widespread, you don't actually get to the chlorite zone because it's either faulted off or it's been intruded by plutons. So these are the kind of typical um, epidote zone um, rocks that you would see at Oyotolgoi. So you see these huge sort of flooding of the matrix by epidote and quartz, um, usually emanating from a, a vein, either calcite on the left there, or you can see it again on the right hand side from epidote. On the right, it's actually truncated by a carboniferous dike. And then you have these conspicuous orgite phenocrysts that have been replaced by chloride and epidote. And then you often see epidote in the bottom left, you can see epidote patches where epidote started to replace a phenocryst or initiated on something and then it's just continued to grow into a patch beyond the boundaries of the um, crystal it's replacing. And then on the bottom right there, you can see little epidote veinlets and um, you've got albite again. K feldspar you see quite a lot in propolitic rocks at OT, but you don't always see that everywhere. It's usually albite, it's common, most common. But as you can see in the post mineralization sequences, you see similar epidote veinlets, epidote patches. On the right hand side, that's actually a carboniferous granodiorite that has epidote alteration as well. So it's not just in the porphyry rocks. When you, when you look at the rocks at the surface, these are the kind of things you see. So you've got epidote in the surface rocks as well, even actinolite alteration in some of these rocks. So if you're in an area that hasn't been mapped in detail, you don't have much exposure and you're seeing this type of alteration, would you be happy to walk away and say, well, you know, we're not looking for carboniferous um, alteration because we're looking for something the same age as known mineralization and that's Devonian. Or would you want to take a closer look? So titanite geochronology. What you might have noticed is that when I was describing all the propolitic assemblages, I never actually mentioned that there was titanite in them. And that's because in the propolitic halo, or from what I've looked at, the titanite is very small and you don't see it in hand specimen. And it's, it's difficult to see even in thin section. The best way to see it is in, on the SEM in backscatter electron images like these. So what we can see here, we've got at the top um, two images are um, mafic phenocrysts that have been replaced by chloride and epidote. And on the left in the orgite phenocryst, you can see has been um, little patches of titanite in, within the epidote. And on the right hand side is a biotite phenocryst where titanite's actually growing along the cleavage planes. We also see vein hosted uh, titanite, which you can see in the two middle images. And then in the bottom images on the bottom left, that's um, quite common to see titanite associated with hydrothermal magnetite, which has probably pseudomorphed um, primary titanomagnetite. And then on the right hand side, another common texture, we see aggregates of epidote, like we saw in the image where it's flooding the matrix these selvages um, and you see little patches of titanite within that epidote um, so that's another common style and um, the analyses were done at the school of earth and environment at the university of portsmouth using laser icpms we were looking for 30 to 50 grains titanite grains per sample the spot size we aimed for was 20 microns, but unfortunately we weren't able to get that every time. So we also went down and used 15 micron spots as well where we had to. And we used Terawasserberg plots to correct for common lead, which is always, there's lots of different techniques, but that's quite a useful one. So in the results, just if you haven't looked at a Terawasserberg plot before, 
These are them on the right hand side. And what we're looking for is um, an array of um, ellipses that sit on that form a regression, and that is the isochron. And where that isochron intersects the lower intercept, sorry, the lower, con the lower concordia intercept, that would be, if you can see my pointer, that would be down here. That gives you the age, basically. And where it, in where it intersects Y, that's actually the common lead value. So in the results, out of the 20 samples, we got 12 samples with relatively well constrained ages. Um, however, there were some issues. So I'll just talk through some of those. So six of the samples had poorly constrained isochrons, which is a bit of an issue using the Terawasserberg method. So you can see here that they sit up to the left here and there's nothing anchoring them down here at the um, lower intercept. So you get very big errors associated with that. And the each um, titanite in these, the, the, the lead concentration was at an order of magnitude higher than the uranium, which is why it sits so far that way. Then one of the other issues was that in many of the samples, the MSWD, so MSWD is um, used to estimate whether um, something, well, the probability of fit to the isochron. So it's usually around one. There's different ways to calculate what the criteria is for the MSWD. But if it's a lot higher than that, that means you've got more than one population in your data or you have excess scatter or over dispersion. But in the case of these samples, these, this, this over dispersion is geologically significant. So if you can imagine having uh, one uh, alteration event um, precipitating titanite, and then you have another event that comes later, so it precipitates a different um, generation, you will have more than one population in your sample and you can't always um, unpick that texturally. So that's uh, one example where you're gonna get um, over dispersion in your data. Um, and the second way is if you have lead or uranium mobility, um, now, in the propolitically altered rocks, the temperature of propolitic alteration is relatively low. It's 200 to 300 degrees, something like that. That's far below the temperature for lead, the closure temperature for lead diffusion in titanite, which is around 600 to 800. So in most of these samples, unless they were in the thermal aureole of the larger plutons like the Campbell granite, um, it's unlikely to reach the temperature that for diffusion. So there must be another mechanism and that it could be dissolution and re-precipitation. So existing titanites are um, dissolved and then re-precipitated and that can lead to this same effect of um, lead and uranium mobility. So in this sample on the right hand side, this is a granodiorite sample and it sits just to the south uh, east of the, the most southern deposits. And you can see an example of both of um, all of these mechanisms. So you've got um, here on the lower intercept, the actual pre-existing titanites in this sample are igneous titanites. And you can see those ones actually sit on the Concordia here, they're actually concordant. And they basically sit around the age of the granodiorite two plutons, which are mid carboniferous in age. And um, the horizontal spread from those igneous titanites is actually um, evidence for uranium and lead mobility. And then you can see as well that we've actually got a second isochron here, or we have ellipses forming a second isochron that's younger than the mid-carboniferous granodiorite. So that would probably be the Cambog granite. So we've got here potentially Cambog granite um, influx of fluid during that emplacement that's now um, overprinted the um, granodiorite. And you can sort of see that here. So you've got these igneous titanites that are nice and euhedral. Then you have these irregular boundaries here where there may have been dissolution reprecipitation. And then in these 
in this epidote over here, you see these little titanites, which may be the younger new generation of titanite. Um, you, there's a couple of papers that are really good and have gone into a lot of detail about um, this type of um, uranium and lead mobility. So I've just put those at the bottom in case anyone's interested. So a summary of the results. Here we've got a population density plot of the titanite ages in red at the bottom. And then we've got a compilation from literature above that. So you can see there's three main spikes in the titanite um, or the titanite ages. So we've got one that coincides with porphyry mineralization. So there's several samples there that seem to have porphyry related alteration in them. And then we've got three samples there that coincide with the emplacement of the granodiorite. And none of those samples are granodiorites. They're all volcanics like in and around um, the plutons. And then we've got two that coincide with the emplacement of the Cambog granite. And then we've got some that have this sort of much larger, wider um, uncertainties, which are more likely to be ones that have multiple jet po uh, populations of titanite or have had some modification of titanite. And if we look on um, the distribution of these samples, you can see here that these yellow triangles, which are core samples that have Devonian age titanite sit right in the middle of the deposits, as you might expect. And you have these green triangles and circles, which are the um, samples that had carboniferous titanites. And they sit just on the, just outside the um, eastern contact of the granodiorite um, pluton. So that also uh, makes good sense. And then we've got the red ones here that um, don't resolve a single event. Now they're the ones with the large uncertainties that straddle more than one um, magmatic hydrothermal event. So potentially have a combination. And we've got um, the white ones here that are potentially, they had no age yielded. They were the ones with all of the ellipses that sat um, close to the upper intercept. And they, a couple of those sit within the thermal aureole of the Campbell granite. So whether some sort of lead diffusion is responsible for that, I don't know, it could be something to do with that. But what's interesting is that the Permian, two samples with Permian alteration, and also actually this blue sample at the bottom, that's the granodiorite that had the Permian overprint. They sit several kilometers away from the um, contact with the Campbell granite. So the fluids from associated with the Cambog granite have uh, migrated significant distance away from um, the Cambog granite and overprinted um, parts of the porphyry halo. And then one of the other important points is here in blue, that sample is taken from propolitic rocks that surround a lithocap there, which was a, um, a prospect. And it was always thought to be carboniferous in age. However, when we analyzed the titanites in that sample, they came back as being Devonian. So the alteration there, it sits away from the well-known um, Devonian inlier. However, um, it may actually also be um, the, the same age as the known deposits, which makes it an interesting prospect. So we can date Propolitic alteration events using the hydrothermal titanite. And here we've resolved three different events. And it's shown that some of these later non mineralization events are um, surprisingly extensive and overprinting areas. So, and also the multiple events, um, although they modify and make uh, the results difficult to interpret. They actually add a lot of detail and give you quite a lot of information about the alteration history. So um, there's definitely a way that you can, before applying any of these geochemical um, vectoring or fertility things, first check that you're, what you're looking at is the right type of alteration. And it's also a great way that if you're in a prospective area that has known deposits of a known age, if you find other propolitic alteration, you can actually tell whether 
um, that is related to something of a similar age to mineralization in that porphyry camp. And I'll just leave up the acknowledgements and uh, open up for any questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a really informative talk about um, this sort of this hydrothermal alteration and how you can, I really appreciate the growth of mm, this hydrothermal tide tonight and, and learning about the systematics of how it overprints or is overprinted by later events and how we can use that in, in mineral exploration is really cool. With that, I would like to open um, the, the floor to our, our first host, Angela, uh, and see, see, how, see if you have any thoughts or questions for Lisa. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Lisa, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. You're, you deliver such clear and well-structured uh, talks. They're wonderful to follow, so thank you for that. Uh, what you've just presented is, um, it's so exciting and it's so uh, terrifying at the same time, just the complexity of green rock alteration for anyone <laughs> exploring in these kind of environments where you can have uh, so much alteration and much of it can be totally uh, irrelevant, even right on top of your ore body. It's uh, a, a real challenge. And I think, yeah, the work that uh, you've done and uh, the team at Load and uh, the the team down at Codes as well is really starting to show that those um, textual relationships when you're looking at uh, green rock mineral chemistry are really important. So finding these ways to um, pull them apart is really uh, useful. So into, I guess there's probably loads of um, exploration geos uh, listening and thinking, how can I uh, apply this kind of work without doing a, a PhD? And so my question to you is, um, a little bit about the sample preparation. Did your were your analyses done on uh, in situ titanites in rocks, and do you foresee maybe crushing and creating mineral separates as perhaps a way to generate much more data uh, quickly, and then sort of hit the problem with numbers? So instead of having a handful of sample, you may have you know many hundreds, if not thousands, of data points from a district. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. So, um, yeah, these were done in situ because I wanted to sort of keep, uh, you know, preserve the textures so that I could show that they were in the assemblage that I was saying they were in, in the propolitic assemblage. Um, I think you could do more um, samples, but actually there's another step to the work that I did, which you might, I think you saw um, me present before, but um, I actually used the titanite, these samples that gave me well-constrained ages, I used those as a training data set and looked at um, chloride and epidote compositions in those rocks. So there's way more chloride, there's so much more epidote. So it's really easy to collect lots of that data. And then I used, um, I, I classified, I made like a classification using that. And that was a really easy way to apply it to way more rocks. So basically I had like a, a certain composition that of, Devo, of the late Devonian chloride and epidote. And, and I could use that to work out which samples had that composition rather than doing the geochronology. So you could do it in different ways. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. And um, that was super interesting. Um, so, um, it is really good to hear about titanite um, being used for stuff like this because it is it is a really nice mineral um, and particularly the fact that it does grow in these lower temperature processes and recrystallize in these lower temperature processes. It, I um, I think it's incredibly valuable and I'm glad that you're you're doing this stuff and talking about it. Um, I guess my the the thing that I really want to know sort of goes a little bit um out of what well i've got two questions the first one is is within what you talked about and you did talk about the different textures and you did show the different textures and they were quite clear um but did did you notice systematic differences in their ages with texture that you were able to sort of link link texture um and age or was it all kind of within uncertainty uh, I see, I, the thing is, you start thinking, okay, yeah, I can see that there's a there's a pattern here, like these ones, you know, these late Devonian ones are like this, and then nothing fits the pattern. So, 
it's it's very difficult and especially in that sample i showed that had the um had the precipitation um the solution like i went back so many times looking to see if i could pinpoint it just based on where that um spot was because i have all the images of exactly where everything was taken and it's it doesn't follow like it's not that simple i think probably um there may be more zoning involved which i haven't i didn't have images that showed enough of the zoning and that might be a way um what i think i i really think what would be great and i know what you can do is when you're doing your analysis of the point you can do your isotopes for dating and trace elements at the same time now i know you can do that with big larger spots on big titanites but whether you can do that on smaller ones i think that'd be fascinating because I'm sure there's a story there. Yeah, I would say so. Um, and, and I don't want to um, steal uh, the question from the chat. Um, but yeah, that my next question was related to the trace elements because um, we have a split stream laser. So you can um, do a uh, curtain. So you, you can split, split the trace element signal from the um, uranium lead signal and you can actually get both of them and you know they're on the same spot which is really super handy um so if, yeah do you think if you get the chance to have a go on one of those or um send, send us some then that would be it would be very yeah. nice well I, see. The, only thing, the only thing i did have was i i had some uh i had some sem um quantitative yeah. data and um, even that showed, so I know people don't like halogens on SEM, but, but yeah. then basically I either had fluorine bearing titanites or not. Um, so without even using um, like the, the actual numbers, um, but it either yeah. registered or it, or it didn't. And, it, and the ones it registered in were the ones associated with the Permian overprint. And so they were fluoro titanites and they, and the Campbell granite, it, it, it's been um, shown there's alteration, it's altered itself. And you see lots of um, light rare earth elements and um, calcium and fluorine bearing fluid associated with that. So it all makes sense. Um, yeah. and it's interesting. And, and the carbonate in the um, samples, in the prophylytically altered samples, is, calcite cross cuts everything at OT and I'd love to analyze that to see yeah. if that's their fluorocarbonates and that's that final overprint is also from the Campbell granite. The Campbell granite. That's so cool and that yeah so that made me think about appetite um as well um I how many can I have one more question please um <laughs> absolutely just a just a tiny question um so did you look at do, do the rocks have appetite in and are you able to maybe couple because you, you, there would be quite a bit of halogens hopefully in the appetite if you're starting to see it in the titanite so would that maybe be a, a complementary um partner? yeah so there's there's um lots you, you can you could analyze any accessory minerals you have to make it applicable to wherever you're uh, things you're looking at and you may have noticed as well on here that the errors are quite large but I have seen work done by a PhD student in our um, group who's looking at South American porphyry that's much younger and um, the results from that have got much better constrained ages and that's yeah so you can use you could use titanite appetite um, anything uranium alanite anything uranium bearing whatever you have in your in your rocks so you can make it work. Awesome. Josh Phillips used appetite in his work uh, at resolution. That paper, I think is in getting toward final stages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for, for that new paper on resolution coming out, Angela. Um, I think it'd be a good compliment to sort of the stuff that Lisa has been talking about today. Um, Let's, yeah, absolutely. I want to go uh, now to, to some audience questions because we have a good one here from Reza Alfarkan. So Reza, um, let me unmute you or you can unmute yourself. And Hi, Lisa. Hi. Yep. 
Yep, uh, very good talk. Uh, maybe I missed some part of your slide. And yeah, that's why I want to ask you about, have you tried to compare the propylytic age defined based on tritonite with the potassium age defined by other minerals such as the biotite uh, by argon-argon method? Maybe that's... Mm. Yeah, I haven't done that, but yeah, that could be another thing to look at for sure. I, uh, I've, I'm uh, primarily in the propolytic zone. Don't get to look at anything with ore in it. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think you could do that. Has, it, has there been uh, argon argon on the biotype from the sort of the potassium alteration zone there? I'm unfamiliar with the state of. I don't think there's been anything like that done at OT. Yeah. It'd be cool. It would be cool to see if you could if you could resolve the difference. I guess yeah, for uh, sure. There's pretty large range of ages and and large errors in some of the Tysonite data, um, so it might be overlapping anyway. But um, we have some questions in on coming in on YouTube as well that I'm just going to go ahead and ask uh, for these people who cannot speak and the voice of of those who can't speak, unfortunately. Um, basically. Uh, we have a question asking if um, the methods applicable to these alteration halos, if this is possible to do on things that have been metamorphosed after emplacement. Yeah, well, actually, the, the work on the uranium, uranium and lead mobility comes, both those papers were on high grade metamorphic rocks. So people talk a lot about lead mobility, but uranium people is, is is much less common, but it has been shown in these metamorphic rocks. So that's actually where it came from. So I think with a metamorphic overprint, with careful interpretation, then you may be able to do that. You may have more um, clear textures if it's between hydrothermal and metamorphic, you may be able to pick those textures better as well. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I'm actually in working on the metasomatic deposits and uh, on the aluminous side we have epidote and titanite growth along with uh, some K feldspar and we interpret this as the sort of first temperature higher temperature metasomatic replacement of the pre-existing metamorphic rocks there but over time uh, what I would call the retrograde stage in in my work the titanite breaks down into titanium oxides and sort of this sort of leucoxine modeled texture and at that point, uh, I think it's a mix of like rutile and, and like brookite or anatase or something, some, some things. And we don't really understand the systematics um, of those minerals for, for uranium lead as well. And you would be mixing zones. So I wonder if you see problems with this, with this overprinting or, or if, if you, you know, metamorphose something. If you're... Yeah, that's definitely an issue because I had that in some of my samples. So those ones, one of the ones that was sitting in the thermal aureole of the Cambog granite, that, that had the, there was all leucoxine in those, like utilization, fine grained, and it's, I didn't, basically didn't get any results from that. They were all very high um, common lead and like no um, radiogenic lead and, and hardly any uranium so but I do think with a lot of this is you've got to just try it because if you if you it's hard to know until you've done you, the ones from your your area your deposit or um you don't know so I would always say try it like if you're analyzing something else and you have some time give it a go and see is there enough uranium in here am I going to get um can I can I do dating on these it's worth trying yeah, certainly. My the deposit I'm at's a, a lot younger, about 30 million, <laughs> 30 million years. So we're limited in that. Um, we're coming to the end of the the question, the question time. We have another one from YouTube, and then I want to go back to the last thoughts from our, our panelists. Uh, the last one I want to ask from YouTube is uh, asking not so much about the titanite, but I think is important asking if there's chemical distinctions between the chlorite in the green rock alteration from uh, the two age populations that we see. Yeah, you can see um, differences in chlorite compositions, and you can see differences in the epidote compositions. Um, and then, and then you can sort of correlate those 
um, compositions between other altered rocks without doing titanite dating. But you, that's really, yeah, that's really cool uh, that, that there's a correlation there. I guess you have to do the titanite dating to know. Yeah, that's the training. The that's how you train your data set. But like you said, this is something you could do at the beginning of the projects as a way to constrain the, the, the timing, uh, at least somewhat, of the propolytic alteration. That's yeah, I mean, you can do it hand in hand with the analyze, if you're analyzing any other um, minerals as well, because you just do it in the same rocks. And these are in situ, so you're literally just taking a, making a polished block out of it and analyzing. I definitely think you'd get a lot more data if you made separates for 100%, that's for sure. But you'd lose the textural relationships, so it's... Yeah, always uh, the cost. Um, yeah, so with that, I'd like to ask for any last uh, quick, quick questions or comments from, from Angela or Katie, if, um, if you... Yeah, Lisa, I want to ask you, when will this be published? When can we read all the nitty gritty <laughs> details and where? <laughs> yeah, it's actually been accepted now in economic geology. So just waiting for it. So it should be available online soon. And um, yeah, there's actually a lot of detail on the method. So if anyone wants to rec recreate it, then it's all there. Super cool. That's awesome, Lisa. Congratulations on on that that's a big yeah thank you <laughs> to get to get through that process so um thanks again sorry if i did not get to your questions but i have to now hand over to to back to tom um to introduce the second half of our early career session so everyone give a virtual round of applause to um lisa for for the work and the presentation she's done today so thanks again and thank you oh i heard it